Hello and welcome to Associated University, a group that is designed to provide supply chain management professionals with access to information on practical solutions concerning the industry's current hot topics. Today we will be discussing labor management programs and how they can help you achieve a range of business objectives including enhanced customer service, increased profitability, continuous quality improvement, employee development, and effective processes. For today's webinar, we're lucky to have two presenters with us. First is Jeff Burdeau, who is the Practice Director for Peach State Integrated Technologies Operational Excellence Team. As a consultant, Jeff has more than 25 years of experience with facility and systems design, expansion strategies, 3PL solutions, and operational excellence programs. Secondly, we have Justin Wilbanks, a Project Manager for Peach State's Global Consulting and Engineering Team. He comes to us with over 10 years of experience in operations management with a specialization in labor management system implementations as well as engineered standards development. We have scheduled 15 minutes at the end of this presentation to answer any questions you may have. You may send your questions at any time during the presentation by simply typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. Additionally, following this presentation, we will also be providing all attendees with a copy of this presentation. And with that, I'll now pass it over to Jeff to get us started. Thank you, Sherry. So for today's agenda, uh, this is my favorite topic. And uh, I'd like to talk about several things. First, give you a little bit of background on some of the trends affecting warehouse labor. I'm sure all of you are familiar with what you face in your local market, and we'll talk about some broad trends as well as some local ones. And then we'll give you a definition of what is labor management. It's a pretty generic term. There are a lot of different definitions, and we want to get it pretty well nailed down for our purposes today. We'll talk about some of the different popular variations of labor management programs. And then, of course, what are the key factors for program success so that you can take away some of the key things for your organization on how to consider, think about, and structure a program that's really going to drive a lot of results. And then we'll close that out and we'll have a Q&A at the end. Why in heaven's name <clears throat> would the Vatican consider doing this? You know, and I thought my parish priest took a vow of poverty. So, you know, while all individuals think about and aspire to do a good job, this underscores the fact that all organizations struggle with harnessing the fundamentals of human motivation in the workplace. So let's open up our first poll question. And this is around what are your biggest challenges with operating a labor intense operation? And go ahead and click on one of the radio buttons and they're starting to roll in. It looks like we've got recruiting and performance are starting to take the lead. And there we go. So the top issues right now, recruiting, recruiting good labor. Performance, so achieving performance, measuring performance, then retention, engagement, and cost. Interesting, cost is the, one of the least issues around labor, okay? So <clears throat> let's look at some of the trends affecting warehouse labor today. This is an interesting chart because what it shows is while you've got demand, uh, the job growth is slowing. However, in the local markets, you know, we see uh, a variety of clients really struggling with attracting and retaining labor and recruiting, and that's certainly underscored by the, the polling. We're seeing rising domestic wage costs, and at the same time, <clears throat> we're seeing decreasing costs of automation. So if, uh, you know, if there are two popular themes that we hear in our conversations with supply chain executives, it's, you know, how do I attract and retain and engage uh, quality labor? and and how do I automate? How do I continue to invest in technology that's going to improve productivity? And if you think about it, those are the two key drivers that uh, underscore growth in our GDP and growth in our standard of living. So we either have to have more participation in the workforce, and at the same time, we need to have continued increase in productivity. And both of those two features have been lagging over the past Oh, uh, seven or eight years, there's been low growth in labor, and there's been low increase in productivity, even with uh, all these technology and automation and artificial intelligence advancements. There's still, for some reason, is a slowdown in productivity improvement. 
And we're also seeing some shrinking outsourcing wage gaps. So labor costs in China, especially on the coast, not so much inland China, and other developing nations continue to increase, as well as transportation costs increase. So we're starting to see a little bit of catching up on differences between domestic and international wage rates. Now, talk about labor costs, and we hear that as a big issue. However, if you look at the long term, Wages and salaries as a percent of the GDP has been on a steady march down for the last, actually since mid-50s. You know, for the last 60 years, it's taken a smaller and smaller share of the GDP. Now, a lot of the GDP doesn't measure some of the support functions, especially supply chain functions, so this isn't necessarily a perfect measure. Perhaps gross output, GO, would be a better measure. It may not show such a decline. However, if I plotted corporate profits as a percent of GDP over the same time period, you can guess what that looks like. It's almost the inverse of this slide. So over the long term, you would think that labor availability, labor quality, labor costs are not a, you know, a pressing issue. But since the economy has shifted over that time, it's still you know, at the local level a very much an important issue. So what is labor management? You know, that's a generic term. I don't think it's the best uh, moniker to use for it but it's, uh, it's what the industry pretty much uses as a standard. <clears throat> and, more, and most broadly, it's you know, those things that you do, those strategies, tactics, you know, habits, and corporate culture that you create that help attract and engage and retain high-performance workforce, and at the same time while increasing company value. So this, if you think about that, this is one of the very few initiatives that a company can undertake that actually delivers value to all the stakeholders. So if you think about alternative investments in technology or equipment or a new plant or uh, new software, uh, it may benefit customers or shareholders or management team, but rarely does it affect all of these. So if you think about labor management, it's one of the very few things you can do that actually benefits employees, supervisors, managers, customers, and shareholders alike. So what is it? You know, you, you, you've probably heard a lot of different things. You might think it's software. You might think it's engineering. You might think it's a pay-for-performance program. And it can be all of those things. And those are all components and features of it. But what I've outlined here are some of the, what I'll call the universal features of LM. And these can take, a shape, take shape in a variety of forms and in different levels of emphasis. But here are some universally accepted features that I think are really important for a well-structured labor management program. And the first is to have effective training and effective training tools. So when you think about the issue that every employee wants to do and aspires to do a good job, it's really important to provide those staff the best training that we can get. So that training can be formal training, on the job training, and then ongoing coaching and feedback. And if you think of an analogy of sports teams or high performance sports athletes, you know, everybody on the Olympic team and everybody at Wimbledon has a coach. You know, the best players in the world still have performance coaches. It's that important. The second thing is to have standard methods of work and following Toyota's Toyota production system, TPS, and lean thinking, you know, standardizing the work and creating standard work is really important. And the reason that's important is uh, you eliminate a lot of waste. And when you do that, when you find the most efficient, streamlined, simplified, and standardized way of doing work, uh, you can teach and coach and push that process out to everybody. So when you want employees to achieve high performance, you don't want them to waste time on doing things that aren't necessary. So really get best practices spread out and adopted across the workforce. Another key feature is when you do a successful labor management program, you are going to introduce different types of communication. So think about labor management as a way to engage and have a different type of dialogue and conversation with your staff. So everybody is always eager to understand how well they're doing and being able to provide them with objective information on a periodic, regular basis is really important. 
And not just posting that information in the abstract, but using it to underscore the emphasis for doing a good job and also to use it to craft how you can fine tune the coaching and feedback that they need so they can do a better job. A supportive work environment. There is a lot of research that is getting pretty interesting today from Daniel Pink all the way back to Frederick Kurtzberg on fundamentals of human motivation. And time and again, it's showing that people respond to positive feedback 10 times better than getting criticism or negative feedback. So it's important to think of labor management as an enabling concept and tool, not as a way to enforce uh, accountability. It's really not what it's for. And unfortunately, uh, there are you know, several cases out there where folks put it in to use that as a, as a crutch to to lean on instead of using effective management tools. But management accountability. How do, I, how do I provide my managers and supervisors tools to run the business better? How do I make sure that they're doing what they need to do to achieve good performance, good throughput, good service, and make sure that they're giving their staff everything they need to be successful? And those tools come from an LMS, a labor management system, or other type of performance reporting tool that provides not only individual uh, performance feedback, but also provides measures and reports both on cost, throughput, productivity, and performance of all the different operations, functions, and even facilities across the network. And then once you have that <clears throat> with labor management, now you have a platform for rewards and recognition. And I want to talk a little bit more about that on how labor management works. So. You know, how do you get that value? You know, how, how does LM work? You know, what are the, those foundational concepts that support its value proposition? So think about this as a building blocks on a foundation for a successful program. And that bottom level foundation is lean process improvement. Now, companies can take this initiative on and can spend many years doing this. And this can be uh, the emphasis of their labor management program as a lean program because Lean's goal is to provide uh, efficient work and eliminate waste. And you know, this is a never-ending pursuit, and it's one of the most valuable things a, you know, a complicated and labor-intense business can do. So once you do that, or as you're doing that, you set up the ability to measure and put values on the different levels of work and create statistically valid goals. So you may have heard the term engineered labor standards, time studies, predetermined time systems. There's a variety of different techniques, such as work sampling, that you can use to measure the amount of work in a task and put a time value on it. And then statistically validate these so that, you know, that they're fair under a different variety of situations. In manufacturing, this has been done for decades, you know, for 150 years with piecework. In distribution, it's been done for about 40 years with the advent of multivariable standards and predetermined time systems. So there are some pretty slick ways to go out and measure and figure out the work content in highly variable job tasks. So once you've got a, an efficient process and you're able to capture and predict the amount of work effort in each task, now you can load that information into an LMS or a reporting system and you can provide the supervisors with objective tools so they can go out and become an effective coach. So think of baseball manager that's got his clipboard and he's got all the stats for his, his teammates. He can go out and give really valuable and insightful information on how to perform better. That's really where the rubber hits the road, where the value happens because people crave that feedback. They want to know how well they're doing. But more importantly, they want to know, what do I need to do to get better? And if they can get that feedback from their supervisor in a really meaningful way, it can change their lives. And finally, with that foundation, you can set up an effective pay for performance program. Not saying that you have to do that, but the point I want to make here is that you don't want to try to create that pay for performance program without first having set up an effective foundation with these three foundational pieces. So now I'm going to turn it over to Justin. He's going to talk about a couple of variations of LM programs and uh, how they might fit your business. Justin. Thanks, Jeff. 
So we spoke earlier uh, about a few of the key features of a labor, labor management program, but uh, within those features, there can be a few different approaches that you can take. So there's a few different factors based on the operation itself that can affect uh, what approach may make sense for a specific operation. So uh, since these approaches are going to affect the overall success of the project, it's, it's obviously really important to kind of understand how they affect uh, the project as a whole. So one of these key factors to consider when, when implementing a labor management program is the size of the operation and the complexity of the operation. So with that said, that leads us into our second poll question, which is how many direct labor staff, employees, full-time employees, and temps do you have in your operation? So we've got this broken down in four different categories, less than 50, 51 to 100, 101 to 500, and greater than 500. We would think about this within within a site. Okay, so it looks like we've got a pretty even mix. I mean, you look at through here, we've got 21% have less than 50. It looks like the majority have between 101 and 500. And then it's a pretty even mix of 24% between the 51 and 100 and greater than 500. So that's a pretty even mix of the, of the folks on the line. To simplify, so we'll, we'll move into some of these variations and how they affect an operation based on size. So we'll divide these sizes into two. We'll call them a large category. 100 associates and greater, or uh, a smaller operation, that's, so that's everyone less than 100. So the first one we'll look at is the large operation. So the first aspect uh, to look at, so a typical large operation, would be the formal strategy and policy. So this is something that is going to be consistent regardless of operation size. Uh, Obviously, the, the, the breadth of the strategy and policy may be larger for the larger operations than it will be for a small operation, but essentially the strategy is laying the groundwork for the entire program. So you want all, all uh, affected parties, so your operations, your HR, your IT, all of these departments need to be included in the strategy and they need to understand how it affects them, you know, how they're going to use this program moving forward. So uh, on top of that, you also have your policies. So how, how do you handle various aspects of the operation program uh, when certain things happen. So if you're going to have engineered labor standards, uh, you know, where's your, you know, your performance uh, level being set at? So how do you account for a situation when somebody doesn't meet standard? How do you account for it when they're over and above standard consistently? So these are all important details that need to be talked through, understood, and agreed upon when you're moving into, a, into implementing a program. Next up is the coverage. So in a larger operation, we tend to look past the direct labor only, uh, as you would maybe in a smaller operation. So uh, some of your indirect hours, some of your uh, support staff, there's going to be uh, more bodies in these areas than a smaller operation. So they become more important to make sure you're accounting for those when you're, uh, when you're tracking productivity and that sort of thing. So we, would, we think of a large, larger operation as wanting to be more comprehensive than just, just our direct labor. So within these operations, we, we typically look at uh, having an engineering foundation. So if we're looking at putting standards together for an operation, as opposed to maybe a pieces per hour or cases per hour, that sort of thing based on historical uh, throughputs, we, we may use a method, say a predetermined time method, such as most. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll build out predetermined methods based on the motions of each process. Uh, you can use most. Another example would be MSD elements. So a lot of these methods are built into some of the tier, what we call tier one LMS systems. So the, the Red Prairies and the Manhattans, a lot of these have the capabilities to implement these these programs within the software themselves. And then outside of that, if you don't go the, the predetermined route, the time and motion studies, et cetera, can also be put input into these systems. So uh, everything is, is, is based on engineered labor standards, so the time and motion of each process. And then with that, the use of an integrated LMS. So we say in integrated, what we mean integrated with uh, the WMS system. So it's typically more robust than, say, a standalone system or maybe just a spreadsheet calculation of, of some of your labor. Uh, XYZ mapping. So we're, we're able to cover a lot more ground. We're able to see uh, the specifics of uh, specific movement. So where the, where the operators are going, how high they're having to go reach a pallet, how many pieces are they picking, all of this kind of stuff. It allows you to use those engineered standards to get to that next level of detail, which you'll need moving into our next area. So formal incentive pay structures. So in order to implement a a good incentive pay program. It, it's good to have more precise metrics that you can that you can get from this integrated LMS system, uh, and then also from your broad uh, workforce coverage. One thing you can run into if you don't cover 
all of your workforce, say you're looking at only direct labor. When you start paying these incentive pay programs, then you can run into issues uh, with certain areas of your operation not getting access to these programs. So it can it can cause a little you know some more complications uh, if you if you don't have access and, and the visibility to to all the areas in your warehouse. Next, we're going to take a look at the the smaller operations. So we would say less than a hundred uh, associates. Again, the formal strategy and policy, that's that's an important aspect uh, regardless of operation size. Again, it may not be as far-reaching. You may not have an IT department or an HR department. It may be just a handful of associates for for some of the really small operations, but it's still important to to review what the strategy would look like for this program, how you would handle different aspects uh, as you move forward. And then a lot of times for the small operations, you, you get more bang for your buck when you when you pay attention to your, your direct labor initially. So you may move, uh, as you work closer to more associates, you may have more hours in some of these indirect uh, areas, but initially the highest percentage of your of your hours will be within your direct labor. Uh, so that's typically what you what you would start with. So your pickers, your you know folks doing put away, your packers, that sort of thing would be your primary target. And then as opposed to engineered labor standards, maybe you look at uh, more work sampling. So you're, you're getting back to your, your pieces per hour, stuff that you can get from your WMS system. So without that visibility to see how many pieces did you pick on a given assignment, uh, you can't really get to the level of detail that you would need for a lot of your engineered, uh, your your more accurate engineered labor standards. So uh, work sampling, uh, productivity tiers. So X amount of of pallets per hour is your is your level that you need to hit. So uh, the idea there is that you you have an average. Uh, you know, somebody may have a really high day because they get all the good orders, but the the idea would be that it, they it evens itself out when they. Uh, hit another day where maybe they don't get uh, such good orders. So uh, it's not quite as precise, obviously, as the engineered standards, but a lot of it's based on just visibility to, to the work that's being done, which brings us to a, more of a simple LMS for some of these smaller operations. So you can still have maybe a, what we would consider a tier two LMS that is integrated with a with a WMS uh, system. It just may not be as robust, uh, but a lot of times some of these programs, what we would consider a simple LMS system is is not integrated with WMS. So it may be as simple as a an Excel spreadsheet that you set up and that you're manually gathering data from from your WMS system or or your order management system and inputting these values every day or every week and then tracking it that way. So it can, you know, there's a starting point based on the size of your operation, what you have access to, uh, and just the, the visibility to the data that you'll need. And then lastly, similar to the incentive pay, formal incentive pay uh, structure for a larger operation, maybe you deal with more, more recognition tiers. So uh, whether it be, you know, the, the highest performer for the month or the quarter or you know fewest errors that sort of thing you know something that's that's a common common way to to be able to incentivize associates in some way uh, without the visibility to get into the, the incentive pay programs so from there we'll move into some of the key factors for the pro, for program success so this one obviously is really important and we've come up with this list based on a lot of our past experiences so programs and, and projects that we've we've implemented in the past that you know if, if a client had certain issues and they did, did or did not do certain things well, uh, we can kind of see the effect that had uh, on the project itself and and uh, with the operation itself. So the first one on the list here is effective workforce communication. This is one of the biggest drivers, in my opinion, of the success of a program. So in my opinion, you can't over communicate. You know, I would I would suggest so if you're if you're about to implement a program, uh, there should be a you know pre communication with the workforce. What is you know what's the vision for this program? What is the what is the purpose? Who is going to be coming into the into the operation, working with the associates in the future, just to kind of give them a heads up? And then throughout the program implementation, project status updates, giving them opportunities to ask questions. So, one thing we see. Sometimes you need different ways to communicate. So maybe a stand-up meeting with your shift every morning, uh, asking for feedback. Maybe there's certain associates that they don't feel comfortable raising their hand and saying, "Hey, it's you know, asking a question about how it's going to affect them." Maybe they're too embarrassed. So uh, another way to do that is potentially giving a, a comment or a suggestion box, so uh, so associates can anonymously uh, submit questions, uh, and then you can answer those uh, in a stand-up meeting or. Or, or via email or something like that. So it's just giving them multiple ways to communicate, ask questions, uh, making sure the message is clear and it's the actual message of what the intent of the project is. Because a lot of times one of the effects of poor communication 
is the associates kind of develop their own opinions, and then that opinion spreads throughout the workforce, right or wrong, and then becomes uh, the way it's viewed. So it's really difficult to kind of change those those views once it kind of gets out there. So it's important to stay ahead of that uh, and then communicate clearly. Next on the list, uh, cascading sponsorship. So this is a term that I heard several years ago, and I really like the way it kind of explains the importance of having the same communication from the director, C-level associate, all the way down to the employee. So one of the worst things that can happen is if you've got, you know, say your managers and, and directors of operation, uh, they have a vision and their way of communicating to the associates is a certain way. Uh, but then maybe you have, you know, some frontline supervisors or team leaders that they are communicating a different message to the workforce. So uh, that's essentially, you know, goes back to some of that effective workforce communication, making sure that same message, a uh, clear message is, is being communicated in, in the same way. So you, you don't want to create conflicting opinions on what the program is going to be about, how it's going to affect the, the associates, that sort of thing. So it's important that all levels share the same views. Next up, enduring support and commitment. So it's, it's important not to think of these projects as a one-time thing. So the project itself is being implemented. You know, everyone's really engaged uh, doing what they need to do in their various roles uh, on the project team. Uh, and then once everything's rolled out, you know, then it's kind of a let let this program run and we'll we'll go back to our normal normal lives and do our jobs and not really think about it anymore. So it very rarely uh, works out to stay the way you want it to stay when you when you have that approach. So it's important to uh, continue your, your ongoing support of the project, uh, continue the communication if there's anything that's changing throughout the throughout the year or throughout the months, uh, whether it be processes or or maybe certain certain aspects of the of the program are changing. It's important to communicate that and continue to support it in an ongoing basis. So Justin, one thing I want to add to this point is this is this is really kind of a sneaky issue here and it's really important to to understand this. So if you think of and you know embarking down a labor management path, you know, that's an, an ongoing initiative of what you want to do. And implementing an LMS is usually a key part of that. But it's a big distinction between implementing an LMS versus a WMS. If you implement a new WMS, I'm sure many of you are familiar with those, it's essential that that gets implemented correctly and it's working properly in order to run the business or else you shut the business down. So which it is a requirement of the business to have that working. There's no requirement to have an LMS, and it's optional. So it's optional now, it's optional the day you put it in, and it's optional five years from now. So therein lies its biggest risk. You know, there's, not, there's nothing forcing you to implement and use an LMS correctly. So it takes more discretionary effort to make sure that you're keeping on top of that, you're focused on it, and it's working properly to get the best results. So that's why we really underscore that enduring support and commitment because it's not it's not self fulfilling. It takes a lot of uh, you know fertilizer, light, and water to keep it going. Okay. Thanks, Thanks Jeff. Uh, so last on the list here, having a plan. Obviously, that's that's an important one. Also, that goes back to our formal strategy and policy. So everybody needs to you know within the operation, all the different departments. Everyone needs to know, you know, what the end goal is. You know, it's it doesn't need to be a thing where you implement an LMS system or a labor management program uh, just because it's one of the, you know, the buzzwords that that are going on in the industry. It's it needs to be clear in what the goal is, what you expect to get out of it, both financially and just from a qualitative standpoint with, within your operation. So it's important for for all those discussions to be to be had up front uh, and everybody, everyone to be on board. With that, I will turn it back over to Jeff. Thanks, Justin. Okay, so next steps. How do you how do you get this going? And I want to give some highlights of how to think about and initiate a successful labor management program. And the first is I'm going to steal this from Professor John Cotter, who wrote the seminal book Leading Change. And I highly rec recommend that book. I'll show you a diagram of his eight step way to lead change in in a couple minutes. But the first is that to build a guiding coalition. There are a lot of tentacles and and piece, moving pieces of labor management. It really affects all parts of the organization. If I had another poll question, I'd ask you, uh, is this an IT project or an engineering project? And really, it's, it's neither. It's a, it's a company project that everybody's involved in. You know, operations really needs to own it and drive it, but HR has to 
really be a you know a partner in this to make sure that the policies are aligned with the company culture. You know, IT needs to provide support. Finance needs to be comfortable with the internal controls and that it uh, is delivering the value that we intended to. So it really is a far-reaching and, and engrossing way of doing business. So it's important to build that guiding coalition to establish some support for it before you get started. And then to develop a realistic business case. There's some wildly successful uh, stories out there, but generally, a labor, you know, well-executed, a well-structured labor management program can have one of the best financial paybacks of almost any supply chain initiative, because they're not capital intense. You know, it's uh, a little bit of technology and some engineering effort, but the far-reaching effects of labor management are pretty profound. So the financial payback is usually what justifies the program. But if you ask folks who have a successful program and you ask them 10 years, 15 years later, what do they like about it? They never talk about the payback. They talk about how it's affected the lives of their employees, how it's made some superstar supervisors, career paths really take off. Uh, and it's really changed the, the culture of the, of the workforce. They've really attracted and retained you know, the, the best people in the labor market. So it can have a pretty fundamental change to the, uh, the culture of the organization. Evaluate your internal resources. You know, this is not something that organizations typically do frequently. So when they're undertaking this initiative, it may be for their first time. So, you know, it's important to have some uh, experienced advice guiding you and training and developing your organization to be able to uh, equip you with the skills to do it right. So it'll take internal resources as well as some uh, outside advice to make it happen right. And then build that commitment. If you're putting it in just because you've got the labor management software module and you figure, well, we got it as part of our suite, maybe we should put it in. That's really not a good enough reason, you know, and, and you're not going to have enduring commitment to make that happen. So listen to your employees. Uh, a lot of companies will take an employee opinion survey and see what's, what the hot buttons are and then craft the labor management strategy to clearly address those issues. And, you know, Build it in a way that's going to strengthen your culture and strengthen the performance of your operation. And here it is. So this is uh, from John Cotter, his eight steps to lead a change. You know, the first is to create that sense of urgency, build that guiding coalition, form a strategic vision. But look at the one I like, number six. Let's jump ahead to that. Generate a short-term win. So one of the things you could think about doing is, you know, do a short business case or pilot program, you know, before you jump into this and demonstrate its validity to the rest of the, the management team and the operation and the, and the executives. It's really important that they understand how it really affects you and, and what it does because there are a lot of misconceptions. People, people think they know what labor management is, but until they've really gone through it, done it, kicked the tires, it's, it's hard to explain to them without them seeing it. So that's a, that's a great strategy to ensure a successful implementation is to generate a short-term win or start with a small pilot. So again, you know, from folks who have done this for a long time, I think it's uh, important to hear what they say. Here's a, here's a quote from Darlene. They've been at it over 10 years now, and uh, she was a great supporter from the HR side to make sure that this program was a, was a success. We want to thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you, Jeff and Justin, for presenting this material. We hope everyone found this information to be relevant and valuable to your organization. Additionally, if you have any questions about labor management, please feel free to email us at info at associated-solutions.com. We will make sure to pass those along to either Jeff or Justin and get back to you. With that, I would like to thank everyone, and I hope you have a great day.